Amen. Thank you for that. And uh, praise the Lord for God's grace at work in our lives this morning, allowing us to be here and to celebrate together. So if you have a Bible, take it and turn to 1 Thessalonians as we continue thinking about Paul's letter written to these believers there in Thessalonica. And uh, in thinking about that, I was reminded this week I uh, received an email out of many that I received. And this one in particular was different. It was uh, for a related to a national conference for pastors that happens every other year in Louisville, Kentucky. I've gone a couple times, and uh, this conference, some of you might be familiar with it, it's called Together for the Gospel. Uh, maybe is my clicker on there, Gordon? Oops. Anyway, it's called Together for the Gospel. We'll see it here in a minute. And it draws over, over 8,000 pastors per year, actually, not just from the U.S., but I think from around the world. So they come together for a period of three days to worship together and to hear wonderful preaching. And uh, in the past, some of the main speakers you might be familiar with, uh, I think many uh, pastors that uh, are well-known like John MacArthur and John Piper, R.C. Sproul, even though he's already gone to be with the Lord. And some of them, I think, are going to be there in 2020. But the, uh, the email introduced one of the speakers who had never spoken it together for the gospel. And his name is Ed Moore. He's a pastor of a church in Queens, New York, a Baptist church there. And uh, he's been there for, I think, a little over 30 years. Anyway, the video embedded in the email, did an, they had an interview of him in that uh, video. And, and speaking through that, and during the interview, he mentioned that there was a time earlier in his ministry when he had become very discouraged. And he went on to say that the only thing that kept him in the ministry was, unfortunately, the, the only thing was the regular paycheck that the position provided for him in order to feed, feed his family. But thankfully, God was faithful, and over a period of time, that, that passed. God continued to work in him and supplied him uh, really with what we see in the passage we're going to be looking at this morning. So here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're looking at this, this divinely inspired boldness, or there's Ed, divinely inspired boldness or courage to keep, keep moving forward and to be empowered to keep then living ultimately a life that's consistent with the witness that we proclaim with our words. So we can praise the Lord that that took place in his life, and hopefully it's taking place in yours. As you think about the temptations that we each face each week, you know, maybe temptations to throw in the towel when you're, you're dealing with a friendship or a relationship that's so draining because it feels like all you're doing is giving and giving and giving some more. Or maybe when you're tempted to throw in the towel in a job that's so it's so maybe so frustrating and discouraging on so many levels that you find it hard to even articulate what you're feeling and thinking. But no matter the situation, God knows and he cares. And this morning, as we return to our passage that we began looking at last week, we're going to be looking at this, this thought. It's not in your bulletin, but this is kind of what I initially talked about last week. In situations that might tempt us to throw in the towel, God can supply a divinely inspired courage that then empowers his people to live lives consistent with their witness given in words. So we're going to be seeing that fleshed out in our passage for this morning, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to read actually in context, so we have all of it, starting in verse 1. So if you have a Bible, you can look there. If not, here's the passage on the screen. Join me in standing as I read at that for us this morning. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1 and going through verse 12. Paul writes, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid, amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with the pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. Even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. But we proved to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. At verse 8, having so fond an affection for you, we, we, were, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because, we had become, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brother, in our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you, as, toward you believers, 
Verse 11, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of one of you as a father would his own children so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I think we are for this passage. Let's just continue as we think about as we think about turning to him in prayer and asking him to continue to help us. So let's pray together. Lord, we, as we read these verses this morning, Lord, we come to the table, as it were, with a variety of baggage coming behind us. Lord, with thoughts that we're thinking, with experiences that we've had that are fresh or maybe ones that have taken place farther back. And maybe we're not at a place now where we are tempted to throw in the towel, but I know that we have at many times been there before, undoubtedly in our lives. And I thank you, Lord, for as for this passage as Paul writes, as he encourages us this morning with these truths, I pray that you would just minister to our hearts. Help us to hear from you and to receive that as nourishment to our soul who experienced a renewal of our hearts and our minds. Lord, to know that you are with us and that you are at work, even the songs that we sang, Lord, speaking of that. We give thanks this morning for that truth, and we pray, Lord, you would help us as we continue looking again at this passage. Open our eyes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we noted last week, I think it's clear in looking at this passage how Paul has made it clear that he has experienced multiple situations as he continued on his missionary journeys <clears throat> that could have tempted him to throw in the towel and give up. Physical beatings, false accusations, unjust imprisonments, and seeing others being threatened because of his actions. All these things were ones that he had experienced, and <clears throat> they could have led him <clears throat> to call it quits and question God's fairness and goodness to him. And Paul isn't unique. We, we face these threats as well. I was talking to someone just recently who was expressing to me a situation that had happened not that long ago where a loved one had passed away unexpectedly. It's actually this person's child, an adult child in their 60s. And just the, experiencing the anguish of that as an older person whose husband had also passed away over 20 years ago. And to now have her son who was caring for her in many ways gone as well was just devastating. And here as we look at Paul, we see this reality of this temptation to give in. But how grateful we are for this, this courage, this boldness that God can give and does give. And as we see Paul writing here, we see the ways that this divinely inspired courage can empower his people to do a variety of things. And we've looked at some of these already this morning, or last week, but I just wanted to renew our mind on this truth because part of that courage that God can give is to live in the reality of our identity in Christ. We noted last week that in chapter 1, Paul would say, and you could translate this as coming not in vain or that it wasn't a failure. Many because of the shortness of time that Paul was there, could have labeled this as being a failure. And, and really, not only uh, this is not just the first time that Paul experienced persecution, we noted as well that in chapter or in verse 2, he notes the fact that, they, that he had come from Philippi and had already, already experienced great suffering there. But in the midst of that, he, he says that he, he and Silas had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amidst, amid much opposition. He goes on, he'll come back to that in a minute, because that's partially what we see him experiencing. And I think as well, we, as we walk with God, we can experience this boldness or courage that God gives divinely, giving to, gives to us. Paul goes on and says that the exhortation that he provided was not one that was from a selfish motive or in any way wanting to deceive these believers. But rather, Paul tells us in verse 4, his identity was rooted in the fact that he had been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Paul knew that his identity as God's child was secure because of Jesus' work on his behalf. 
he had received the stamp of approval. Prior to going into ministry, I worked as a CPA, and so I audited many companies who produced financial statements that we would then look at and then issue an opinion on. And you always ran the risk that in the future, there might be something that would come to the forefront to say, well, actually, these financial statements need to be restated because of a material or a significant error. And so that threat was always there, especially those companies that were publicly traded where their shares of their ownership were sold on the, on the New York Stock Exchange or, or the NASDAQ. But with this, this, this approval here, we don't have to question whether or not in the future the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice is actually enough. So that we stand before God, there isn't this sense of, boy, I don't know, you know, what Jesus did for you, I, I don't think that's quite enough. Paul was living in the reality of his identity in Jesus, that he had been approved by God. And not only that, he says that he was entrusted with the gospel. So Paul and every spiritually born again follower of Jesus Christ has been entrusted with the gospel that Jesus proclaimed to share with those around us who are perishing in their sin. And we know that we are all perishing because of sin in light of the fact that we see the consequences of death. And we, we see that ultimately in the physical death that we all, every single person who comes into this world will experience. So Paul is living out his identity in Jesus Christ. He was able to say, I speak to you not as as a man who was trying to please you in any way or try to get something from you, but, but his motive in, in talking to them and in sharing with them was to please God because God's the one who examines his heart and he examines our hearts as well. And so as we think about applying this and just thinking about ourselves living out, living in the reality of our identity in Christ, if we possess the label approved and entrusted, then how, how should those labels provide the right filter through which we evaluate everything that comes into our lives. If I have the label approved, I know my identity is secure. My identity is as a child of God. God as Father perfectly and completely loves me unconditionally. As a citizen of heaven, a citizen of the kingdom of the King, King Jesus, who as the perfect ruler provides and protects and supplies and loves me perfectly. As one who has the Spirit indwelling me, I have been commissioned as a missionary sent out and empowered by this Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to share the message of this King. And so I'm able to filter all that comes into my life in light of those truths, in light of that reality that I have been accepted. I'm approved because of Jesus Christ. And so in light of that, I know that I'm, what I'm experiencing today is for my good and meant to help me exercise my faith and to draw me closer to my Savior. And so even when I experience the consequences of my sins, at times God does discipline. But even in those times, I know that those are meant to refine my faith. And so as we are tempted to throw in the towel, God provides this divine courage for us, first and foremost, to live in the reality of our identity in Jesus. But Paul continues on, and he mentions what we looked at last week as well, this love that we can love others with, the affection of a nursing mother. We saw that in verses 7 and 8 that, that Paul describes. <clears throat> and I just wanted to remind us of this connection that a, that a nursing mother eats real nutrient-rich food and, and her body transforms that into milk for her baby. So too, in the same way, a, a mature believer who feeds on the, on the food found in the Word of God is then able to share that nourishment with the younger believers so that they can grow as well. Not that they're not eating from God's Word themselves, but we all need that person that's farther along to help to nourish and encourage our, our faith. I think also, as a nursing mother is careful and what she eats, because sometimes that can affect how the baby receives the milk, right? It can cause an upset stomach for the child. So too, we're careful as believers 
who are, who are seeking to, to disciple those coming up behind us, we're careful what we take in as well. So as not to introduce error or information that would hinder that person's faith coming behind us. Notice as well the words that Paul uses here to describe in his description, gentle and tender, fond affection. Paul imparted his own life and because they had become dear to him. And I had to ask myself and I ask you, do, do I have the courage to let myself feel these toward the people around me? Because part of the problem is that if we've been believers for very long or even as unbelievers, we experience Occasions where we might have been burned by someone else or betrayed or backstabbed or thrown under the bus. And so our greatest hurdle in seeing this truth lived out in our own lives is not wanting to be hurt. And so where do we get this courage to say what Paul said, what he says here in these verses? It comes from the Spirit. It is literally a supernatural work which comes through the Spirit, that same Spirit who enabled Jesus to do what He did. It was by the power of the Spirit that Jesus turned the other cheek, that He cared for and sought out Jesus, Judas Iscariot, who would, who would betray Him. And Jesus still endured that threat to the end. He knew this was the plan that He lived, that He was called to live out, and He did so in faith every day of His life trusting the wisdom of the Father's plans for him. So Jesus loved Judas with the affection of a nursing mother. Again, we're reminded we're wholly unable to, live, to love with this kind of love apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So I ask you and I ask myself, where, where does the Spirit need to show up in your life and in mine to enable me with this courage to love with the affection of a, of a nursing mother? Where does the Spirit need to show up and give you hope and help and a renewed heart for what God is doing? I mean, think about the characteristics of a nursing mother that she displays toward her child or children if she has multiple children that are born. First and foremost, a sacrifice, a loss of sleep, a loss of freedom and activities. Back in 98, our first son was born then in April. By July, we were up in the Chicagoland area, and I hate to tell the story, but it, it's a reminder of when the fireworks were taking place, myself and um, I think Hannah went with us, and then her Rachel's parents, we went to the fireworks show. It was the best show ever. But Rachel stayed back with Ben. She missed out on that. Why would a nursing mother do that? Because that was the best thing for the child, right? This, this idea of sacrifice. Why do moms do that? Well, they sacrifice because they love their children. Why do believers do this? Why are we willing to do this? Well, it is a supernatural work of the Spirit in us that we are enabled to do that. We need the Spirit's ability and His empowerment. And that comes as we experience this, this divine courage in the face of difficulty. The next one we see is in verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, Paul says, For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. We'll come back to verse 10. Now what I want you to see here is this, that, that as we experience this divine courage, that we are enabled to labor selflessly for the benefit of those in the body. And here Paul is relaying, he's recounting for them what he did for them through this courage that God had supplied to him. In the face of what he had experienced leading up to coming, to Thessalonica. Paul had supported himself. He chose to, to make the, to pursue the path of tent making. He could have, once he came, he could have said, you know, based on what we experienced in Philippi, I think I'm going to rely upon whoever it is that God brings to, to, to salvation and not work. I'm going to give myself fully to that because the time here might be short. And the Philippians actually sent him some, some support while he was there. He could have said, no, I'm going to rely on these believers that God brings about to provide for me financially. But Paul didn't do that. He tells us here in verse 9 that he was working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of them. 
he also, I don't think he wanted to be a burden in the sense that he wanted to protect them and himself from any criticism that could have come by those who would question his motives. To say, you're only doing this to line your own pockets and you don't really have the benefit, you don't really have the, the good of the people you're talking to in mind. Well, again, he does this because he loved these believers and, and wanted to see and do everything in his power to see them succeed spiritually. Paul labored because he didn't want in any way to be a detriment or a stumbling block for the gospel's advance. So we first see that Paul labored selflessly for the benefit of the church by not asking them to support him. He took the responsibility of financial support upon himself so that no one could accuse him of any impropriety. Which leads us then to the, the next part in verse 10. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. So we see Paul beginning as he as he spoke here and thinking about these verses, he mentioned first how he sought to work in a way that would be selfless. But he also here describes how he walked in their midst. And he says that he could call them as a witness to testify of how he lived among them. But it's one thing to call a human witness. It's another thing to appeal to the witness of God. And here Paul does that as well. You are witnesses and so is God. And what are they witnesses of? Were there witnesses of how Paul walked among them? He knew he wasn't perfect, but he did know the track record that he had lived out, the, the track record of behavior that he had, had lived while he was among them that was honorable and patient and truthful. Paul experienced the, this God-given courage that led him to live a life focused on holiness. That's what these words in verse 10 are describing of devout and upright and blameless. Now, again, where does that come from? I think it comes from, it is a reflection of the time that Paul has spent with his Savior. Paul is interacting with, with the one who came and sought him and died for him and now has provided this opportunity not only to be stamped with the stamp of approval, but to also to be entrusted with the gospel, to be called to, to be preaching that. And so in response to that, Paul's desire is, in light of seeing how glorious and majestic the Lord Jesus is, he sought to reflect that in his own life. Again, not perfectly. But he would use adverbs like this, devoutly, uprightly, and blamelessly, to describe the work that he did among them. The behavior that he lived out in their midst. So let me ask you, how, how would you say your time spent with Jesus is showing up in your devotion and uprightness and blamelessness that you're displaying toward others? No matter your age, whether you're young, middle-aged, or older, all of us are called to be displaying this. And it shows up, doesn't it? I mean, it shows up. If, if we have been spending time with Jesus, it shows up in the in the thoughts that we think and the words that we say, the actions that we commit. Of not wanting in any way to dishonor this king that we serve. And when we do, to be quick to confess that to him and to seek his forgiveness. Secondly, in what ways is God calling you to act with the divine courage and laboring selflessly for others in this body or even extending to others in the church universal. As Paul said, he came to them and he was laboring night and day for them. What needs do you know about that are, that are outstanding in the people around you that you can minister to as an expression, a tangible expression of the love of Christ? Because not only are we changed in our walk, but we're changed in our work, how we live as selfless, and for the benefit of those, not only in the body here, but you could even say the body universal. The last thing is we, we see this, this, this divinely inspired courage that, that allows us to live in the reality of our identity in Jesus, that, that allows us to love others with the affection of a nursing mother, and, and allows us to labor selflessly for the benefit of those in the body. I want you to see lastly in verse 11, that this leads 
or, or that it, it allows us to lead like a godly father would his own family. Verse 11, Paul writes, Just as you know how we are exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. Here I think we see the gender distinction that God has hardwired into men and women. Mothers are more often tender and nurturing, while fathers are more exhorting and encouraging and imploring. And we need both of these in our spiritual lives. We need those who are nurturing and, and, and coming alongside and helping. We also need those who are saying, come on, you can do it, you know, let's go. You need to, to be seeking the Lord more, more fervently. Because at times we are unruly and we need to be admonished for our disobedience. And in thinking about what Paul will write later, I think comes to mind in chapter 5, verse 14, he says this, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And there are times where we find ourselves in, in one of these categories. But thankfully, we don't stay there, but at other times, we might fall into another one. Encourage the faint-hearted. Those who are just, they're faint-hearted, they're going to faint. They're, they're just overwhelmed at the moment, maybe with what they're experiencing, and we're called to encourage them. Others are, are weak. They're weak in faith. They're, they're, faith. they're not going to faint, but they're, they're, they're just walking in this weakness of faith that's a continual, like a fever. It just, it's hanging on. A swamp fever, right? It's just hanging on. It seems like it's hanging on. Or being patient. I'm sorry, help the weak, be patient with everyone. There's a sense where, where we need that patience of another. And so as Paul writes here, I think he, he has in mind these varying levels of spiritual health. And we need, and, and as we find ourselves in those areas, it, maybe you kind of parachute in and you kind of think back on, well, yeah, I remember when I was faint-hearted. I, I, I've been unruly at times, or I was weak. And you need the divine courage that God can supply to help you in those, myth, in those times. To experience being led by a father, a father who is dedicated to implore and to come alongside and to offer the form of encouragement that rallies the spirit of another to get back up and to get going. And we can do that for others, for one another. Also mindful of the fact that there are ditches that can fall into as we think about these words that Paul uses, we don't want to fall into the ditch of being too harsh because a spirit can be broken. But we also don't want to be too soft because at times where conf confrontation needs to take place, we, we need to be strong to do that. It's an expression of love. We need to put off fear that sometimes paralyzes us from acting and saying what needs to be said. We need this divinely given courage that motivates us to action and to obedience. So wherever you find yourself, maybe this morning it's not directly at the point where you're feeling like you're throwing in the towel, but, but I want you to be encouraged if you are there or if you have been there recently or if you haven't, you're going to probably face that soon enough that God can supply a divinely inspired courage to, to help us to live and to love and to labor and to lead in these ways. And it's all for the purpose of producing believers whose way of life reflects the witness of their words. Remember Ed Moore, the pastor there in Queens, New York City, who had gone through that period of discouragement and depression as he reflected upon the work that God had called him to and as he had wrestled with the doubts that we all experience at times, no matter our vocation, What he came back to is what we see, I think, in this passage. We need the Spirit, the Spirit to provide us this courage to be able to be a people whose way of life reflects the witness of our words. We don't want to contradict our witness by, by throwing in the towel, by saying, I'm giving up. 
Now, that doesn't mean that at times God doesn't change us from one thing to the next. I'm not saying that, but I think there is a sense where just emotionally and, and, and I think spiritually, where we're just weighed down and beaten down by the events and circumstances of our lives, God is saying, no, don't, don't throw in the towel. Experience this divinely given courage that, that helps us to be a people who are reflecting the witness of our words. We believe these truths to be sure and true, and they, they are steadfast, and we can rely upon them. And at times, we are, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, people who are, who are at times unruly or faint-hearted or weak. That's where we need the work of the Spirit that much more to help us. And so as we close this morning, let me encourage you For the next several minutes, I just want to give you some time now to, to pause. We have a response card in, in the bulletin this morning. It's just, it's really in many ways blank. Because I want you to think about the work that God's doing in you. All right, maybe there, there are areas where on the back of this card, this green card, you can pull it out, where you can, you can celebrate this morning. Or, or you just need help. Or maybe you're unsure of what Christianity is. If that's where you are, I'd encourage you just to put your name on that bottom part and would love to share the gospel with you of how you can know forgiveness for your sin. Because that's the reality of, our, of our, the, the sin that we experience. We are separated from God. We are in need of a Savior to, to take that punishment and to deliver us, to provide forgiveness and reconciliation. So as Pastor Brandon comes up and, and we sing this final song, just thinking through your, your response, that I would encourage you, I'm gonna, I'll be in the back in the foyer, if you'd like for me to pray for you, just slip out and we can pray together. If you just feel burdened right now for what's going on in your life, feeling that sense of wanting to throw in the towel, you're not alone. God is at work in our midst. He is at work in your life. And maybe it's just a prayer for and you can pray at your seat as well, praying for this courage that God would give you that you need maybe in this moment to sustain you. And maybe the First Thessalonians 5.14 resonates with you. You're thinking about where you are at this point, even this morning, just being renewed in your heart and knowing that God is at work. He cares for you.